the March 11, 2024, High County Board of Education meeting is called to order at 6 p.m. Can we all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and the Black Heart Country? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, this is a special board meeting today, as you can see by the number of people, both in our hallways, in the seats, and off to my left here, I wore my red tie and blue suit in honor of all this exciting day. Superintendent Miller, do you have some information you'd like to share with us? I do. I'm going to give a quick overview of information, and then I... Um, I would like to take the superintendent's information in a moment um, to introduce some pretty amazing student athletes from our girls basketball team winning a state championship, uh, the first in 25 years, to our speech and debate team who has brought home their 44th state championship, um, our robotics team, we have a state championship and two additional qualifiers, so we have the trifecta of state championships and we also have the West Virginia Music uh, Education Association and the Wheeling Symphony Orchestra Music Educator Award, both given to Mr. Ben Podolsky. And we also have Mr. Schultz here and two amazing artists that are student um, winners. So my superintendent's information is going to be truly all about the kids and what they've done um, to make a high county schools proud. So to kick that off today, we have Mrs. Richards. Um, to introduce our first wonderful group of student athletes. Uh, a lot of things have happened at Field Park <laughs> in the past two weeks. Um, we're so excited to be here. Thank you for recognizing these wonderful ladies. I'm going to turn it over to Coach Young here to talk about their basketball accolades. However, I would it would be amiss not to mention that these girls are leaders in the classroom, leading in volunteer hours. Um, they're the top of the line girls. And, among that, state champion basketball players. Thank you, Mrs. Richards, and thank you to the uh, board and Dr. Miller and Mr. Jones for having us tonight. Uh, you know, it's been a really wild and crazy and wonderful week. Uh, these kids uh, just were amazing. Uh, we came together Saturday under in the on the biggest stage, and they all performed, and I, I couldn't be more proud of them. I know that High County Schools is proud of them, Wheeling Park is proud of them, the city of Wheeling is proud of them. Uh, they they earned every every bit of it. Uh, and Mrs. Richards talked about uh, these guys in the classroom. Uh, I forget the exact number, but the bank that we talked about, our team GPA, our, our team GPA was around a 4.3, I believe, um, which is just amazing. Uh, we have a team like this where a lot of the work goes in the basketball and we don't want to have to worry too much about it. Uh, what's going on in the classroom and, and they never uh, have that uh, problem and that's that's a huge relief as a coach uh, and I just want to quickly recognize all of them um, starting with our freshman Carrington Miller our sophomore Seneca Heller and Taylor Downer our juniors Elena Dalton uh, Kaylee Hunt did not make it Maggie Hupp Seneca I'm sorry Lala Woods uh, Alexis Bordis and then our seniors, Natalie Dougherty, uh, Merritt Delk, Jillian Huffman, and Riley Hicks. Uh, those four seniors are special kids. They're all special kids, but we're really going to miss those four. Uh, we couldn't have done it without that kind of leadership on our team this year. And I do want to give a quick uh, mention of my assistant coaches over there. Uh, wonderful coaches, wonderful people. Uh, definitely could not do without them. A lot of times, assistant coaches uh, don't get the recognition uh, that the players do, uh, but Kevin Heller, uh, Lucy Milton, and Monica Bragg. Uh, thank you again for having us. Um, we're going to enjoy this, and uh, we are looking forward to doing it again next year. Congratulations. Can I say something real quick? Absolutely. You know, the last time uh, girls that uh, our girls won a state championship, they won it two years in a row. So. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure at all. That's a fun fact. <laughs> Any questions from the board? No questions. Yeah, I mean, congratulations. I know a state championship is hard to come by, but 
to come by. It's, uh, you may think it's your year, maybe it's not, and it takes a lot of work and a lot of dedication. And I understand you guys. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for being here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Secretaries, administrators, and our principal, Mrs. Daler, 
have shown tremendous enthusiasm and backing for our future league team. Their well wishes for the tournament and the jubilant celebration provided by our parents and boosters upon our return to White Palace with another state title were incredibly uplifting. Such support motivates us to strive tirelessly towards meeting the high standards that you have established for us. Finally, I want to I want to once more extend our thanks to Dr. Miller and the Board of Education members for acknowledging our achievements tonight. We truly value your support and aim to keep making Ohio County proud. We hope you continue to support our program as we now turn our eye to a national tournament of champions where we have had five students qualify. I'm sure my coaches have a proposal in the works already. Thank you all again. Does that mean more money? <laughs> Coach? Yeah, we would love for them to mm -hmm. tell, to let them know, and if you're captain, division leader, and what grade you're in. Uh, I'm Addie Perks. I'm the co-captain of the speech team. I'm Riley Russell. I'm co-captain of the debate team. <laughs> and then I'm the debate division leader. And all three of them are individual state champions as well. They Woo! all are there. Yeah. that you must feel every year as you continue the tradition must be awesome on you and we're very proud of you. Great job. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you also to uh, the coaches who have been recognized. I know they put in a ton of time. Uh, I mean, the addition of time the students are putting in. But so thank you to everyone who has invested in the program to help our kids see this kind of success to where we are really proud. Not thank you, more. Mark. Yeah, I don't think it works though. <laughs> One other thing I wanted to mention, and, and some of you may have seen this or not, but it was either on Twitter or Facebook. I saw a picture of these kids watching their counterparts win the state championship. That was really, really cool. Yeah, well, two years in a row now. It's now it's tradition. So <laughs> they got to keep going back. Saturday afternoon, we like to gather around an iPad and watch the state final. <laughs> this year was more. <laughs> Great job, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. that we offer at the high school, and then it actually goes out into the community to an actual art show, 
and um, a little bit of competition never hurts either, especially when Ron the winning is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate the thoughts about Pioneer Park for screaming. We are a team up there in the high school. We always start our new students. It's a great opportunity for to get three teachers from the school one. So we're constantly <laughs> going in and critiquing each other's work and working, making the work even harder. Um, we've been in charge of the program now for five years. And I told Ms. Mitch whenever I was hired, I said, we're going to tear this program apart and you're not going to recognize it. We can do five years and we're going to make this happen. And so in these five years, we've had winners at the Cycle Fine Arts Show. We've won other awards. Now this one here is the West Virginia Art Education Association um, Art Show. And it's kind of also like the state championship, just not another board. <laughs> and each county is allowed to enter 10 pieces. So that's 550 works that are entered. And from those, there are six categories. There are three, um, three prizes for each category. And then there's a best of show. Um, so the best of show award this year goes to Mo Smith with her hard work. Um, I'll let her talk about here in a minute if she wants to. And then our first place in painting goes to Juliana Walters. I'll also let her talk about her work. So essentially we have what is called the first and second place in this state. So um, we have to get to our amazing teachers and coaches and our families for supporting our kids. Um, it's a great place to be and I think this was a perfect example of how fortunate we are to have such an awesome school system. Okay, moments for mission. Um, Mr. Prop, would you like to start us off? Sure, thank you. Uh, congratulations to all of our state champions. Uh, what a great prelude to our moments of mission with, with such accomplishments. I think the best thing that I've seen watching these uh, young adults come through with their victories is how diverse um, the areas. We have athletics, we've got art, we've got uh, STEM issues. It, it is amazing uh, the scope of activities Ohio County Schools presents and that anybody that finds something they like, they can achieve it to the highest level our state offers. So thank you, Dr. Miller, and, and your team for availing our community that opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Crowell. Well said. Ms. Satterholt? Sure. Uh, 
um, my moment of permission was just going to be all the students we recognized here today. I'll piggyback on what Mr. Croft said, um, but I also recognize the new robotics that Dr. Miller mentioned as a whole new area that we've added to our repertoire. Um, so uh, just congratulations to all the kids winning a state championship in basketball. That's huge. You work, you know, a lot of kids never achieve anything like that, even though they work you know, really hard to get it. So it's such a special, special accomplishment. Our speech and debate, obviously. I mean, the pressure grows by the year for those poor kids, um, but they just are awesome and they just do such a great job every year. Um, we're just really proud of them. So um, that, that's my moment for missions as well as our young students that we're going to hear about and celebrate here soon. Thank you, Ms. Satterbolt. Mr. Chocolates? Oh, I echo what uh, Ms. Lane Cross said. Be back on what Mr. Cross said. Uh, this is such diverse activities that we have at the high school. I always told all my students when I had them as freshmen, as a freshman in the room, the one piece of advice I could give any of them, any of you youngsters that are out there right now, when you get up to the high school, get involved. There's something for everybody, as you can see right now here tonight. Uh, also, best wishes to our boys basketball team who are competing for uh, the state tournament first round game on Wednesday. Thank you, Mr. Chocolates. And again, going last year, but I, I just want to reiterate how special tonight has been with the uh, girls' basketball team. I don't know about you guys, but I just love watching them play. They are special. I, I wrote down here, they got it. And that, that is something special. Uh, the speech and debate team continues to amaze me year after year. They're absolutely fantastic. I also wanted to talk about Mr. Podolsky, uh, the strings instructor. Uh, what a marvelous um, award that he received from the Wheeling Symphony, and also to be recognized by the West Virginia Music Educators Association. That is quite an accomplishment. One more person I'd like to mention, her name is Jennifer Davis. Jennifer is a third grade teacher at Madison Elementary School. Um, she secured a grant, uh, a letters grant, L-E-T-R-S. It stands for Language Essentials for teaching reading. And what this is, it's a special program that provides some unique perspectives on how to teach reading. I, when I saw it on television, I, I was very impressed with, with what, she's, what she's doing. And if it works, maybe we'll have to include that in more, in more uh, schools and more grade levels. So great job. Okay, Parade of Champions, we got more to come. Dr. Miller? Yes, we are very, very excited to introduce you all to our newest member of um, our High County Schools family. Um, Ms. Richards, <laughs> our little friend here. <laughs> it's a beautiful day. He's coming. So, um, meet Parker. Parker is about 11 month old golden retriever. Um, Parker's an employee of High County Schools. He's a working dog from seven to three. Um, he brings emotional support to our building uh, for adults and for students. Um, he is amazing. Um, he was trained at Ultimate Canine in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, so we cannot take credit for his well behavior. <laughs> <laughs> we just have to make sure we maintain that good behavior. Um, he is there to support um, and provide our students unconditional love um, and our adults. Um, he's very low key, as if you can't tell. Um, and he has a certain, they have to have a certain temperament to enter into the therapy dog, the service dog program. Um, I'm fortunate enough, I'm his primary handler, so at work, after work he comes home with me and he gets to be a puppy. Um, so he works from seven to three, and then at home and on the weekends, he gets to be a puppy, but we still have to reinforce his training. Uh, with me is Amy Rice. We have seven other secondary handlers. Ms. Rice is the department chair of the special education department. And throughout the day, Parker starts his day with Ms. Rice, and she reviews training. And then he goes to Ms. Tusa's classroom, and she's also a special education teacher. And we integrate Parker with her class, and the kids in Mitsusa go out and make classroom visits. 
Parker's uh, the most popular thing going up until our state champion. Um, and we put out a Google form for teachers and uh, to sign up to come and visit the classroom. And it's the next eight weeks is already full. Um, and other schools have already requested uh, Parker's visitation. So, um, so the, how we receive Parker is the governor's office. It was uh, uh, the first lady. Her vision, her she wanted to put a dog in every county, and um, we so graciously were chosen and happily accepted. I have had the opportunity to see Parker with children. It's unbelievable. Um, since this man, did he do that now, or is he off? Yeah, he can do it. Can you do a snuggle and a visit? Yeah, maybe you want to snuggle and a visit. Yeah. Oh geez. It's gonna be so cute. You're gonna have a really hard job. Are you ready for it? It's amazing. Alright, come on, Parker. Go. Alright, now he, he's worked all day. Parker. Oh. Oh. So you have a sad child Dang. or a sad person and Parker comes to snuggle. How do you think that makes the work feel? Good boy. Good boy. Yeah. I wish I had a ball here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So we're very appreciative. Did he visit you? He visits, yeah. It's not as big as a snuggle. Did he visit? All right, come on. Parker. Parker, come. Parker, visit. Stay. Stay. You're not stay. Stay. Free dog. Good boy. Oh, good boy. It's precious. And it, it actually brings, yeah, it calms people down. It calms people down. So. It was all kind of neat stuff. We are very excited to share Parker with all of you to see more wonderful things happening. Uh, and super appreciative to the seven handlers. I mean, that's yeah, that, that's a big commitment to our kids. Any questions for the board? Well, thank you very much for bringing Parker out to visit with us. What do you think, guys? Was that be cool with the schools? to recognize our people for the amazing things now they're doing in the classroom. So we have our Young Writers Contest winners today. I think Mrs. McLeod is going to jump into action. Isn't that as exciting as Parker? Where's Adam? I would get over there as soon as possible. But Michael says you cuddle well. <laughs> snuggle? Oh, snuggle? That's snuggle. a lie. <laughs> Very hot. Snuggle. <laughs> okay. I'm going to try to talk loud, but I don't know how good this is. We were getting text our sound. We need to work on it. But um, Dr. Miller, Mr. Jones, Mr. Garber, members of the board, central office staff, and guests. The young right good stuff right there. The Young Writers Contest began in 1984 and is supported by the state of West Virginia through funding to Marshall University to use by the Central West Virginia Writing Project. The contest is organized by the CWVWP, which is housed at Marshall University's South Charleston campus with the help of the West Virginia Department of Education. The contest is divided into categories which include grades one and two, grades three and four, grades five, six, grades seven, eight, grades nine, 10, and grades 11, 12. Submissions may be on any topic and in any prose genre such as fiction, nonfiction, narrative, <coughs> memoir, an essay, but must stay within the word limits allowed per grade level. All submissions must be the sole creation of the student 
and composed during the current school year and judge it judged on the following criteria. Ideas, organization, voice, word choice, sentence fluency, and conventions. So it's my pleasure to announce our top three winners in each division. And after they're judged, then they get to kind of read through them and it's a lot of fun. So we're gonna start with grades first and second. And in third place, we have Josie McGowan. Josie McGowan is a second grader at Woodsdale Elementary School, and Mrs. Busack is her teacher. And Mrs. Busack is here, so we want to say thank you to her. And in second place, and Jeff, Josie's, do you remember what the name of your story was? The special snowman. How cute is your voice? Say that right into your ear. What was it? The special snowman. The snowman. Very good. And then in second place, we have Willa Sachs. Mama. Willa is in second grade at Woodsdale Elementary. And her teacher is Mrs. Busack. And her story, do you remember your title? The Harsh Winter. The Harsh Winter, good job. And in first place, and the neatest thing, is all of our first grade, all of our first place winners in their division are invited to attend the West Virginia Young Writers Day at the University of Charleston. It's gonna be held on Friday, May 3rd, and they are allowed to bring two guests with them. And there will be uh, keynote speakers, and they include, uh, in the past we've had Mark Harshman, uh, Homer Hickman, Bill Lepp, and Cheryl Ware. She's one of my favorites, I fangirl over her. And then they also will get to do some writing sessions throughout the day too. Um, so, at we will, when we hand out our first place, we'll give the letter so the parents can have that and know what to do so we can get them registered. And in first place, we have Greta Dobson. And Greta is in second grade at Woodsdale Elementary, and Mrs. Busack is her principal and Remember name yours? Oh. Mrs. Busack's her teacher. <laughs> Mrs. Minch is her principal. Remember the name yours? Snow Pops. The Aww. Snow Pops. And was that where they turned in? For, you made them in out of the snow and then they, they, they came alive? That's what I thought. All right, so a round of applause. We're going to have them go out and take pictures. So, parents, if you want to go with them, we're going to have you take pictures out there. Congratulate and keep writing. Keep writing. You know, huge thank you to Mrs. Busack for taking the time to have those readings. She had to clean, she had a clean sweep. And to Mrs. Minch for making it important for the schools. In our third and fourth grade division, we'll start with our third place. We have Liam Beltry. And Liam is from Steenrod. And Ms. Homan, who I saw was here, but she may be back. There she is, peeking out. This is his teacher. Do you remember yours? Christmas party gone wrong. Christmas party gone wrong. And another fun fact about Liam is he was in the top three last year, too. So he is a really good writer. Congratulations. In second place, we have Logan Stewart. There's Logan. Logan goes to Middle Creek. His teacher is uh, Miss Walter, but she's home with the beautiful baby boy. So, and his principal, though, Mrs. Lewis, is here. 
<laughs> and do you remember the name of yours? <laughs> well, that's okay. Yours is called The Beginning of the End. Ah, there it is. Okay, and our first place winner is McKenna Snyder. And McKenna is in fourth grade at Steamrod. Ms. Homan is her teacher. And do you remember yours? Christmas miracle. A Christmas miracle. Must have been, we had a Christmas miracle at the beginning of the end and a Christmas party goes wrong. And the first so, one was all snow. Yeah, and the first one was all snow. Must have been a theme. All right, so uh, congratulations to all of you. You guys are gonna go out and get your picture. Here you go with them. In our fifth and sixth grade division, in third place, we have Haley Chambers. She's coming. She's kind of proud of that there. And Haley is in fifth grade at Woodsdale. And Mrs. Randolph is her teacher. Oh, and she's on student council. Do you remember the name of yours? Just Ducky. What's yours? Job. And in second place, we have Abby McGowan. I feel like I'm seeing a theme with that last name. I'm not sure. Uh huh. And Abby is in sixth grade. And Mrs. Tucker is your teacher. And do you remember what your response? Prisoner of Alcatraz. Oh. Prisoner of Alcatraz. Looks like a man fighter. All right, and in first place, we have Miles Horton. And I'm not sure, I don't think Miles could make it. Miles is a uh, fifth grader at Warwood School. And Marcy Hunley is his teacher. And his was titled Jacob the Genius. Okay, so you guys can get your picture so in. Yes, you can go. The McGowan's are very tired. They've been up and down a lot. Okay, in our 7th and 8th grade division. In third place, we have Lincoln Masler. Did I say that right, Lincoln? Marler. Well, I'm going to have to change his name, too. Lincoln Marlin, I'll just let you know that it was Mrs. Baker, so wrote your name down. Not a strong hand writer. Third grade, third grade, I'll make a new one. And Lincoln is in eighth grade at Bridge Street, and Mrs. Vickers, and turn so we can see you. And do you remember the name of yours? Moving from Arizona to West Virginia. Moving from Arizona to West Virginia. From Arizona, West Virginia. We do have a good broadcasting voice for sure. And in second place, we have Braden Davis. Braden Davis is an eighth grader at Bridge Street, and his teacher is Mrs. Vickers. And Braden, do you remember what your story was called? Hockey life. We got a hockey player. All right. And then in first place, we have Alexis Shaw. Congratulations. And in case you couldn't tell by her cute sweatshirt, she is eighth grade, Bridge Street. Mrs. Vickers is her teacher. She'd like you three to look at her so she can get a picture. You were waving the fingers. Look at me. And do you remember yours? Your title? Growing up without parents. And and I'm going to tell you. It was a really big story. I'm very touching. She's awesome. She's awesome. So she's our first grade, our first place, and we hope that she will go to Charleston when we had it. Okay, you guys can go get your picture. Congratulations. In our ninth and 10th grade division, 
In third place, we have Adessa Queen. And now, and Adessa is in 10th grade. Uh, Ms. Seals is her teacher at Park, and your math. It was called Goals, <laughs> and it was really cool because she wrote her goal was she wanted to be a mom, and she wanted to be a mom because she's always liked to take care of kids and because of what a great mom she has. So it was really, really good. So congratulations. And then Kerrigan Moses. Tenth grade. Wheeling Park, Mrs. Seals. And yours was called Bulls. And do you remember what you wrote about? Yes. You want to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret, but it's good goal. And then in first place, Sydney Wilson. And yours was what do you want to be when you grow up? You want to share? Uh, sure. Okay. Um, so mine was about um, I when we were given a lot. Yeah. And, um, it was like we could achieve one goal in our life, would it be? And mine was to inspire others. And so mine was just about uh, people who inspired me and how I want to inspire others. So, yeah. Great. Right. Really good. You can see a lot of picture pictures. So, uh, really, really inspiring things we read and such talent. And this is like next to going to the pre K classrooms, this is like my second favorite thing to do because then I get to read all the things and see how creative they are. So, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McLeod. Wow. Thank you. Um, it's really, really cool, though, that we've spent almost 45 minutes just talking about our students. So, it's a really, really a great feeling to have this opportunity. So, Okay, moving on in the um, agenda, we have two, uh, Ms. Jody Miller, from your face to a high county school, and she's going to talk about uh, the gifted, the docuseries. Oh, well, here. Hello. Oh, yeah. I need Parker, and I need the speech team. Very good, Mr. Jones, uh, board, um, thank you for letting me speak here this evening. Um, I just wanted to share some information with you all. Um, most of you know me, uh, but those in the room that don't, my name is Jody Miller. I have worked at the High County Board of Education for 18 years now as the Federal Program Secretary. Uh, Mr. Saunders is my immediate supervisor. I have resided in Wheeling my entire life uh, with my husband, Gary. We're the proud parents of four children. Uh, Heather, Sarah, Sam, and Nathan, who all attended Wheeling Park High School. I promise, I know we have a lot of great things here today, so this isn't going to be a Debbie Downer, but it is for a minute. Um, so above all things in life, um, my proudest moments were uh, giving birth to my four children. I just love and cherish being a mother. Unfortunately, uh, my husband and I suffered the most horrific loss imaginable. At approximately 12.30 a.m. on March 25th in 2008, we received a knock at our door. We were informed by two deputy sheriffs that our oldest daughter, Heather, had been in a car crash, and we needed to get to the local hospital as soon as possible. Heather was 21. Uh, she was just a few weeks away from graduating from the WD School of Nursing. Her ultimate goal was to work in critical care and become a nurse anesthetist. One week after the crash, and after all life-saving efforts were exhausted, Heather was declared brain dead on March 31st in 2008. How do you move forward after a tragedy like that? How do you bury your daughter? Living your worst nightmare. She was my very best friend. She was the role model for her siblings. There were times that the pain was so bad, just even to take the next breath was almost impossible. So after many, many dark days following the tragedy, um, and really no will to live, 
I found solace and hope in the fact that Heather was a registered organ donor. Her magnanimous gifts saved the lives of four complete strangers. She also gifted um, her heart, both of her kidneys and her liver. She was a tissue donor as well and enhanced the lives of up to 150 strangers. Heather's family has spent the last 16 plus years honoring her memory through our 501c3 nonprofit, the Heather Miller Memorial. We, we raise money to award nursing scholarships to local students across the Ohio Valley and through West Virginia. To date, we have awarded over 247 scholarships and or renewals. Um, we have funds in the Hyatt County Schools Foundation as well as the WB School of Nursing. I'm not here to ask you for anything. I'm really here to offer something. Uh, Heather's story has been chosen to be featured in a pilot episode of Gifted the docuseries. The film will take you on a journey from the officers at our door to the doctors and nurses that took care of Heather and to a really Park High School graduate who received her scholarship to her selfless act of being an organ donor. From tragedy to triumph, as some people call it. I'm a mom on a mission. I didn't want the crash to define who Heather was, but the fact that she was a registered organ donor and saved complete strangers' lives. So I'm here to invite you to the red carpet premiere this Friday up at Willing Park High School at the Performing Arts Center. Mrs. Davis and your packets have given you um, information. There's a promo code for uh, complimentary tickets. Um, you're also invited to the VIP event. We have included our culinary arts students at the high school. They're preparing some food and snacks for us um, prior to the event. The doors open to the public at seven. Uh, the movie starts at eight. It's an hour long and then there will be a Q&A with the producer and my husband and myself. Um, one other thing, I am sincerely humbled to announce that the City of Wheeling, the Ohio County Commission, the Governor of Justice and the State of West Virginia, Ryan Weld and the West Virginia State Senate, Joe Manchin and the United States Senate, have all signed proclamations to make Friday, March 15th, 2024, Gift a Day in Wheeling, in honor of Heather and all those who have given the gift of life. Mayor Elliott will be at the um, premiere to present the proclamation and read it as well. So, it's for the general public, um, you can visit Eventbrite. I have flyers here I'll leave out in the front. Tickets are $15. Um, I think it'll be a great event, and I really hope to see you all here. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. We have 10 seconds left, Jody. Oh, your, nephew, you. your nephew is going to cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> Next, uh, we have another delegation, Beth Collins, and she's going to talk about school based health center. Thank you. visit, 
The parent is contacted and given full access to their records. And this is even more parental involvement than when an OCS school nurse sees a student right now. It's actually more parental involvement. I also have heard that there's worry about access to a student's medical chart. This is a HIPAA concern, not a WVU Willing Hospital mandate. It doesn't apply to this population of student whatsoever, though. Uh, well, uh, all the students being seen at Madison are under the age of 14, so their parents would have full access to their MyChart records. Uh, rather than spending time discussing how consent is provided in the MOU, I would suggest a better consideration would be to lay out how school-based health policies will be adapted when and if school-based health expands to middle and high school students, who that would affect, right, because they're over the age of 14. Last Monday, I had the opportunity to tour the proposed space at Madison and meet with Principal Trio, the school nurse, uh, Superintendent Miller, Assistant Superintendent Jones, and representatives from the hospital. Principal Trio shared incredible stories that to me are even more substantial than any data I could provide. She discussed children needing vital medicine. So much all that stuff. <laughs> She discussed children needing vital medicines delivered to them at home because their parents struggled to see them through care and incarceration. Others who haven't seen a pediatrician since they were born, and many more who are using the ER as their only source of medical care. I've seen this board in our whole state praise Principal Tria's leadership at Madison and so I hope that her full support behind a school-based health center is more than enough trust for this board to also back it. Often it's difficult for people to understand the reality of what others go through when they themselves haven't experienced it. For many in this room, including myself, scheduling and making appointments for our children is standard, though a bit inconvenient uh, when you have to reschedule work meetings or take time off work. For many Madison school families, that inconvenience is on a completely different level. There are no medical providers on the island. With the suspension bridge being closed, the closest providers are in Ohio. However, many of the students can't access that care because they have West Virginia Medicaid. If a parent or caregiver doesn't have access to transportation, the challenges of getting to a sick or well child appointment is made even more complicated. Imagine being a single parent trying to navigate our public buses with multiple small children and maybe one who's fevered or vomiting. A school-based health center is not, or then you're running late, you miss your appointment, and then your pediatrician suspends care. That's a common occurrence in pediatrician's offices. So a school-based health center is not designed to take away that parent's right. A school-based health center is designed to build health equity for that family and for that parent. Again, just because some of us haven't experienced that situation, doesn't mean that it's not the reality for our county's children and families. I hope we can see the Madison School Based Health Center on the agenda as a formal vote soon, and that all the board will support this step toward health equity for our county. Thank you for my shaky voice. <laughs> Stop here behind you. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate your insight. There are no further delegations, so we're moving on to personnel. Uh, the first item on the personnel agenda is to go into executive session for superintendent's contract renewal. Since Mr. Schramm is not here today, uh, the board has agreed to table that until the next meeting. So we're going to... Uh, I need a motion for that. Thank you very much. Would yeah. you like to make that motion? I move that we table uh, personnel item A, superintendent's contract renewal, uh, table it until the next meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Two seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of tab tabling um, the executive session for superintendent's contract renewal, do so by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. 4 0. Ms. Davis, thank you. Um, school based health clinic, Dr. Miller. Uh, we have a few uh, personnel items. Oh, I'm sorry, that's correct. I skipped that. Yeah, um, Dr. Mark Williams is retiring for a position as a 200-day instrumental choral general music teacher assigned to Middle Creek. Um, Ms. Dr. Williams has been with the High County Schools for 16 years. Alexa Lawson, um, we'd like to acknowledge um, the accomplishments of upgrading degree status with Alexa Lawson's master's to a master's plus 15. 
Marlena Martin from a master's to a master's plus 30, and Jody Wade from a bachelor's to a bachelor's plus 15. We'd all would also like to um, highlight Joseph Long, who is being recommended for a position of 261-day custodian at the Newly Park High School, and all other personnel have presented. Is there a motion to accept the personnel agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor of accepting the personnel agenda as presented, do so by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. 4 0. Oh. Thank you for correcting me on that one. I almost skipped it. Okay, now we can go to uh, school based health clinic. Mr. Miller? Dr. Miller? <laughs> Um, yes, this is Scout, and I had an opportunity to meet with um, representation from uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph as well as WD Hospital to look at the space. Um, you all have been sent the MOU and information detailed in that MOU. Um, we are in the process of securing grant money, so um, I, get, I believe our ask tonight is um, to move further with the school based health clinic so that we would be. We would have the opportunity to garner grant money. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Stout, and I do get a lovely <laughs> to the point where I need to say a question. <laughs> so, no. um, it, honestly, um, the revisions um, that were provided to you via email um, that was following the last board meeting where um, you expressed some concerns with the draft. Um, so, I worked with Jacob Manning um, in incorporating those changes. Um, I have not sent it forward to WVU because we were asking for feedback to see what you thought about the revisions. Um, I don't think anything came through at this point, so it has not been sent to their legal at this um, present time. Um, also, in the email, there was an attachment for the policy. Um, it was a draft policy that was requested at the last board meeting as well with sample um, consent forms that could be used um, specifically for Ohio County Schools, school-based uh, health clinic and dental clinic. Um, I don't, nothing has come through as far as any changes, so that still remains in the draft form. Um, so at this point, I guess, um, we're just looking for if there's additional changes that you would like to see made to the policy, um, so we can forward it to WVU for their legal to review. Um, I left the strikeouts in the email that was sent so you can see how it was written versus the suggestions that were made and um, inserted. Um, and like Dr. Miller said, we did meet um, with several people at Madison Elementary and we took a tour um, of the location, um, answered questions, and that was um, the piece before taking it to the board. Um, They, we requested 60000 from them, um, and they are taking it as a recommendation to their board. Um, also, I received an email at the end of the week saying it was from Lori Maynard, um, and they were meeting with their board this week for the 60000 that was requested um, through the foundation. Are there any questions? I've got a few, actually. Um, so, is the MOU, which I think the, some board members would like to redline some things and take it back for further discussion, is that related to the Sister of St. Joseph's grant, or they is one conditioned upon the other? We added, based on the request from the last board meeting, that if the funding was secured, um, the MOU would be put in place. So. Um, we requested for the renovations, um, 60000 from Sisters of St. Joseph and 60000 from um, the Milan uh, we, Pushcar. Pushcar. <laughs> Foundation. Pushcar yes. Foundation. Yes. And what's the status of the Milan Pushcar request? The board is meeting this week, and Lori said that she would speak with me by the end of the week. Okay, and how much was that request? 60000 so that would be a total of 120,000. Is that the total budget to uh, complete the build out? Um, it's 175 for the renovations. However, the third piece of it is the Benetton Center 
which they're not able to fund um, the renovations because it has to be either a staff or something for the build of the program. Um, so they're working with WVU Medicine and they're going to fund and then they're going to fund the nurse practitioner and then that, that funding would be provided to us from WVU for the second, for the third piece of the renovation. If that makes sense. It's like an exchange of funds. <laughs> So they're going to be paid for the, the personnel. <laughs> yes, and then that funding would be freed up through WVU to then provide to us. Okay, so is, is that would, okay, I'm just, I'm trying to balance how, you know, if, if a nurse, because as you mentioned earlier, that the, um, West Virginia delivery healthcare would be subject to Medicaid and maybe some payment. So you'd have Milan paying them WVU billing Medicaid for the services. Is that how you Then it would be providing the nurse practitioner a salary. For what period of time? Do you know? Six months. Six months? Is six months. months. Typically, a nurse practitioner takes six months to be viable with billing at a school based on <coughs> the nurse of Benedum's funding, six months of the salary. Just as a matter, Mr. President, since you're really knowledgeable, could she join up there? Because I don't have a problem. Yeah, I think it would just be beneficial for us all to talk, and as we talk, the yeah. folks could hear you from okay. home. Yeah, we can. Can I have you guys are okay Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> and I promise I won't be a shaky voice. <laughs> no, be sh you got it's teamwork up there now. You got somebody yeah. beside you. Yeah, you're a huge piece of the funding and the vision. Well, and, and and Beth, thank you for your passion. Yeah, and you, well, and it, it, it's I'm talking about how I was talking about like grocery items. They're they're. they're this, this board right now is faced with some hard decisions. Yeah. I mean, the next section too. And at the end of the day, we're all trying to create the healthiest environment for our students that we can. Um, but when you do that, there that benefit comes with a burden. You know, what are the burdens on parental rights? You know, the 14th, it's a procedural due process, the 14th Amendment. And, you know, re the reality is that standing consent is a problem because it's that that ability of the parents to say, well, I do or don't want my child to have this treatment. But it's also, I think, the biggest challenge because, as you said, there are families that, who do you call? And that's what we're really wrestling with. I don't want to deny the delivery of health care to a student that needs it, especially how that affects every other student because you have a sick student in school. You know, so, and I don't think anybody would disagree that healthier students do better. And so I really want to work hard to try to find <coughs> a balance of policies and delivery of health care. Um, and I don't know that any of us are going to love what we end up with because it's not going to be exactly what we want. But I don't want to not try to pursue this. So I, I appreciate your stick to itiveness coming back again from August because this is an important time, I think, in Ohio County Schools. And look at how much we're accomplishing now. Um, if, if we can increase the health, and, and uh, as Mr. Chocla said earlier, after you know uh, all of those kids came through, get involved. And if you're healthy, you're going to get involved earlier. Um, but I do think there are some issues with the policies. Uh, but the question I had is, when, when you think in terms, what is if anybody needs care, you can go to emergency rooms and, and any emergency room. And Pala, there's a federal law, uh, and I and I practice a fair amount of healthcare law, so. I'm, fairly familiar with this with this area is that you have to treat somebody until they're stabilized. Then across you know the island uh, in the uh, Stone Plaza there is you know your WVU has a, a, a facility there. Um, but is if, if we have this healthcare facility, you know we have health right in the community, you know, are there other organizations we should think about partnering with as far as providers and how to get that care to the Yeah, community. so the most likely school-based health provider is what's called a federally qualified health center. Yeah, FQHC. Our FQHC is Change Incorporated. The unfortunate thing that uh, Change Inc. has been operating school-based health in Brook and Hancock counties for years. In fact, we funded a beautiful new center up in Weirton. Um, they, they base every decision on patient to provider ratios and how they can get HRSA funding, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with HRSA, it's a federal grant program for primarily rural-based health services. And um, Ohio County does not have the best patient-to-provider ratio for an FQHC to deliver a school-based health center. 
So while it's not impossible that changing would consider running a school-based health center in Ohio County, it's pretty unlikely because they don't see it as, uh, I, wouldn't, I don't wanna say profitable, because FQs are not profiting. Well, but, I get yeah, um, so it, it has been discussed with changing years ago. That doesn't mean changing would be completely out of the opinion, but uh, it has not been something that they wanted to pursue. And, and we can just say it has to cash flow, because it can't survive if you can't pay to keep it up. Is the weird facility a standalone? It, it, it's inside uh, of the elementary schools, same as the Brook County is at Brook County High School. And within those centers, who are the, who's delivering the health care? Uh, they're NPs or PAs, some, very rarely NPs. But, uh, oh, and are they affiliated just with changing. the community? No, they're, they're employees of changing. Okay. Yeah, and that's standard at other hospital-based, school-based health centers. So the primary deliverers of school-based health centers across our nation are FQHCs and hospital programs. Primarily, sometimes health departments. Um, and uh, when you were talking about being sustainable, um, so yes, they they have to be sustainable billing wise. So they have to kind of figure out how many hours to put that NP or PA at the facility. So I think they're really smart here in Ohio County to start out one day a week and then work up from that. Well, that was my question. What are the days of the week for some of your seniors at the facility? We were just looking at either an eight hour day or two half days. Okay. Like start. It's smart to start slow. What are you seeing in, in Weirton and? Oh, they're full practice even in the summers, but they start slow. They started slow. Just most school-based health centers start slow, and then you have counties that, uh, like Charleston, for example, that have you know eight school-based health centers. They've got mobile units. They've got all kinds of uh, things. So because school-based health has been around in our state since the late '90s, so some of these sites have really grown and expanded. If you were to look at a particular model to say that system got it right and it, it is hit on all eight cylinders, who would, who would you look to within our state to say that that's the best model to model after? I mean, there's a lot. Uh, we do a lot of funding with this. I don't fund you know, I, New River is a wonderful one down in like Fayette counties and Summers counties. Um, Cabin Creek around Charleston is an incredible one. Um, uh, those would probably be my two, but I mean, I could, there's 44 counties that have them. So. And so with the 44 counties, how many of those counties are in a school versus a standalone? Almost, well, all school-based health centers are in the school. Are in the now, school. Now, some are mobile units. There are some that are mobile units that go from school to school. Um, but either they're in a trailer right outside of the school unit um, or they're inside the school. That's the. And do you see greater or less in value on having a mobile unit? I think if you're in a really rural county um, where schools are spread out, uh, it's absolutely vital to have a mobile unit. I don't know about the uh, how much it would make sense for a bio county because it's not a super wide, you know, spread out county. But you know, mobile units are very fundable from the federal government, so it's not impossible to think about. Okay. Yeah, and you were talking about sustainability really quick. The other piece, though, is that the billable hours are one component of it, but they are also going to see a decrease in unpaid medical bills to ER visits. Because most of the students, not most, I don't want to quote that, but a large percentage of students are using the ER as their medical providers sure. and so they will see a decrease and a lot of times those bills go on the kitchen counter I'm guilty of it and never get paid or they get paid ten dollars a month right so W Wheeling Hospital has an incentive too to keep this going because it will hopefully what they hope will also see a decrease in ER visits but the well. hospitals have to also grant charity care yeah I mean any nonprofit you have to and it's required on your file number 998 so they, but they but they have an incentive to have this be successful they well, they, yeah keeping training. people out of the emergency room is, is an incentive for everyone um, so in, in kind of looking at that end versus the parental right end is just uh, that it, it is a fundamental constitutional right is to have that right for your kids Absolutely. and so we'll, at least my lens is to view this and how do we try to strike a balance to keep the parents that want to be involved and keep the parents that want to give that consent every time that right 
and then you know, to, the, to the extent that there is a child and there isn't a parent that is involved, uh, is, is to try to provide some care for them. Yeah, and after hearing the, after hearing the, from the last board meeting that we had this open discussion, um, when we drafted the policy, um, we did specify you know, in more detail than the MOU um, that what Ohio County would do with our practice in the clinic. And so it provided in the policy, you'll see that it says that there's the sample forms, obviously, that are attached, um, and that there would be a signed consent form required. And then it goes on to state that if there wasn't a written consent on file, there would be a phone call made, and it would only there would only be one visit, and it would have to have a verbal consent with two witnesses um, and document it. And then if there was no if no one answered or no one could be contacted, that the treatment would not be provided and they would be referred to the ER. And, and I think that's going in the right direction. Yeah. Um, and I think as far as the MOU is concerned, it could really be drafted that you know, one is we're bound by state law. You know, we, we can't draft beyond that. But we could state in the MOU is you know, pursuant to the attached uh, policies as amended. And, and we can tighten that up to, you know, again, part of what we're hearing is some of the board members are from the community, from parents that just have a concern that they, they're concerned that their child would go in and some treatment would be administered and they would be told afterwards. And that's fair. And as a parent, I would want to know that I'm consenting to my children's care before the care is granted. And then would you be a parent then though that would actually sign that for them to be seen or would you probably say, ah, I'm good, I have a pediatrician, I don't really think that they need to be seen at this police cell center. I so wouldn't maybe sign I won't anything sign that's a blanket person. consent. Right, so you probably wouldn't. But if I were a parent that knows like, I have missed so many appointments because I can't get my kids to their pediatrician, I would probably rejoice at a universal consent. And the, exactly. So we look at it a little differently. So how do we find a place that we both land, right? Leah and maybe it's an election it. that says, look, I want to be informed every time, and then you consent that exactly, yeah. you you have that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, what I want to do is grant you that right without taking away mine. Mm -hmm. yep. That's what that's that's the balance I'd love to strike and be able to deliver that health care for kids that just simply need it. And when we were working with Jacob, one of the things that we talked about is just removing all of the ambiguous information and details from the original policy and making it very specific in our county policy because of you know what we like what I was taking notes when we were talking things that were a concern um, and to make it very specific that consent can be withdrawn at any time if you sign it because you're signing all the back to school stuff and then you get a phone call that says we have so and so here with an ear infection and you say oh no I have a pediatrician I'll follow up then you're with your consent's withdrawn and you don't have to you know, deal with it anymore well, I appreciate the effort that you guys have gone through for Fortunately, Jacob is now a hilltopper. I know, he gave me, he said, and these are the people you need to contact if you want to follow up with this. So it was his last day. <laughs> well, I hope to get local counsel again. Um, but I do think that, that it's going in the right direction and I think as, as a group, uh, we need to continue to balance this and come up with the policy we often live for because I don't want to miss the, the kind of opportunity of the funding. I'd like to hear back from Mylan to see what that funding, if they're gonna come through with some. Um, and you know, also, uh, just to say, who is the other? The Benedum. Benedum. I, when, I feel strongly, Benedum? so all of them will be decided by the end of March. Um, okay. Ours is April 8th, our board decides April 8th. I mean, our our funding goes pretty specifically. That was gonna be my question, what yeah. is the time? time yeah, period? so um, for uh, Mylan, it's this week. Uh, for Benedum, it's the end of March. Um, and for us, it's April 8th with the check coming out after May 1st. Um, so really, almost all the funds would be secured, checks in hand in by May. If, I mean, I don't want to speak for the two other foundations board, but they've been heavily involved in this process. And we often do funding arrangements together. We just did one in Mingo County, or we're working on one out in the Eastern Panhandle to expand school health up there. So. so we have two more board meetings, <laughs> on the 25th and the 8th. So that would give us time to be able to place. The other thing I wanted to say is thank you, Ms. Stout, for uh, taking care of uh, organizing that policy and 
please make, did we all get a copy of that policy? Dave, did you get a copy? I, I had an email to me. Yes. Molly? Yeah, I had an email yeah. to me. Okay, um, did you have any questions? Yeah, I have a few comments if other people are finished. Or any questions? Um, I, I have question. nothing else. Thank you. Okay. Um, I first, you know, I, like Mr. Cox said, no one here wants to keep health care from children who need it and aren't otherwise able to get it. Um, I, I understand that, I get it, um, and so I just want to put that out there and I appreciate everything that everyone's done and everything that Andrea Trio and her team does currently for the students at Madison. Um, a question that I have, kind of related to Mr. Croft's first question, so if there was not an MOU in place, would the funding still come or is that a requirement for so all of, uh, I can speak for my foundation only. Um, we would uh, be willing to provide an extension uh, if there needed to be more time, but I cannot say that for an hour of like, mine. When I've been up front from the very beginning after our last meeting, I was very upfront with the story saying, you know, they want this contingent upon the funding source, so we're still in draft mode. Mm -hmm. And she was like, that's okay, we'll have it, you know, we'll have those it, it's pretty standard that this is what happens, like because you kind of it's chicken and the egg, right? You got to have the funding for the board to feel comfortable with it. So these foundations that are familiar with school-based health know this, know that it's kind of an ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the like right now, it's being proposed as a single provider. Um, I just as I've thought about this over the last couple of months, I really feel like we should be considering opening it up to other providers in our community if we're a public school system. You know, providing patients essentially, you know, healthcare is is a competition these days for patients, and if we're um, going to be providing captive patients for a healthcare provider, I feel like we should at least consider opening it up to more than just one provider. Opening it up to multiple providers who might be interested in participating um, in something that you know is potentially impacting the whole community. I don't know what. Who would that be? There's various independent. Um, Medical practices throughout the community. I can think of a couple. Um, yeah, the dental clinics ran by a private dentist, Dr. right? Where it used to be really health, right? I believe, right? So, um, um, and so that's something that I think that we should at least consider is, you know, opening it up and saying this is something that uh, we're considering doing. There's going to be a build out, you know, with various third parties for providing money for that. You know, are there other healthcare providers that are interested in participating and, and being part of this and, and being patients that will necessarily come as a result. So I have never heard of school-based health center have mul having multiple entities running. Okay. Um, yeah, you I guess. Cycle I, through, I mean, you could cycle through different providers. I guess if you were, open, I, I really don't know. I would have to like go back and see if there's any school-based health centers that are like that. I would say that if the MOU, right, is with Wheeling Hospital, right? That's who That's it with. the draft. Yeah. yeah. Um, that would, no, I mean, if I were a hospital, I don't know if I would be okay with that, but I mean, I'm not Well, gonna, in one sense, they're only one day a week. Yeah, it's only one day a week. And so if you had so. Med Express that says, hey, we'll give you Thursday. Mm -hmm. Or a physician in town, a VO and MD saying, I'll give you this day. Or a P that says, I'll give you Tuesdays. So okay. I'll only speak for the way mental health is provided and across our state when we have grants that fund community health centers um, or uh, behavioral health comps, and they cycle through therapists. The problem is, sometimes, and I don't know if Ohio County fe feels this, um, you do not develop a relationship with those providers, and they are there's no tracking of where did this therapist go? They were supposed to be here on Tuesday, and they never showed up, right? Because, oh, they left. They went to Pennsylvania to practice. And so um, my, that would be my only hesitation. If you have multiple providers from multiple, multiple entities in the school, probably Principal Trio and the nurse, are being taxed to keep a handle on that schedule, that's a lot. So, I don't know though, I mean, it could work, I have no idea. Okay, I just, I just think it's a, go ahead. But for the consistency of the, the, of the yeah, nurse Yeah, that's my concern. If a kid is sick on Tuesday, goes to one uh, provider, and then on Thursday, get, they get sick you again. Yeah, that's, that you, there's no cross pollinization yeah. there. And <laughs> and I, you can't go from one flower to the next. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just thinking about how important it is for us to really form and encourage parent involvement. And if there would be a different person, it's not going to be a comfort level that we would, that we're hoping, even when we talked with Principal Trio, just her mindset 
to make sure that the parents feel comfortable with the clinic and the person working there. Um, the Madison is their home, um, and so I think just having people revolving in and out wouldn't really set the tone for that, um, just because the staff works so hard at building those relationships. And, and could willing, so could willing um, WVU Medicine, could they open up to having more days other than just oh, the one? Yeah. 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 I, I understand the start, start small yeah. concept, but what I'm saying is that maybe they would like to have two or three days, and that would open it up for more availability. I think the record sharing would be the only hesitation if there were multiple providers that had different data, like uh, intake systems. Like, how would you, you know, Molly Adderhold comes in on Monday and sees Willing Hospital the nurse, and then Dr. Minzi comes on Tuesday, and see how do they share that information? Well, it's always HR, so if it's in the WVU database, and you have somebody else that has access to the provider. But they would have to be a WVU employee, but then it's like, well, not there is a, there's a larger database that shares. Yeah. I did look yeah. this recently. So, I mean, but those are, are hurdles, those are all obviously. Child but concerns. the other thing, I don't, it's not, the same risk exists for WVU on somebody leaving as, as other providers. So I don't, I don't want to go on a presumption that we're going to have the same person forever in that comfort level. Well, that would be great if it were the case. I will but say Swiss Health Centers exists. have some of the highest uh, rate of recidivism of their employees than any other medical institutions across the nation. Who? School-based health centers have the highest rate, one of the highest rates of recidivism for, for retaining, retaining uh, yeah, employees. That's better word. <laughs> retaining, yeah, recidivism, <laughs> sorry. Retaining employees. Um, yeah, not recidivism, that's a bad thing. Um, retaining employees. Well, I just got dark. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I mean, even just, I guess I just feel like, I don't want to leave out all the other people who, or other healthcare providers that might be interested in something that could end up being fairly, um, you know, a good source of patients for them in the future. And as a public school, I feel like we should consider whether it's opening up to maybe others if they want to come and do, do a proposal for what it would look like for a different provider to maybe come in on a more consistent basis or whatever that might look like. Um, I just think that that's something that we should be discussing. So that's a hurdle that's going to stop the vote. I mean, you could write it into the MOU that it's something that's reviewed. Who your provider is could be reviewed every two years, every three years, something like that. Um, and then I, I do have a few kind of more specific questions. I can email those or I could maybe run through them. Um, I'll just kind of go through a couple of these quickly. Um, so my understanding is in my chart, so this was mentioned in Dr. Miller's email, and then I think also, uh, Bethany, you were speaking earlier, but in the, the my chart, the age is 10. You re you referenced HIPAA, I thought, before 14, but my understanding is my chart is 10. According to the WVU Willing Hospital representatives, it's 14. Okay, so maybe that changed from the last time we looked at this. Okay, I'll look for that. Um, so you talked about chronic disease management in the MOU, if that were started with like diabetes, things like that, just things that are going on, the parents could come in and say, yes, you can administer. So our Catholic schools here in um, the Northern Panhandle have been having school-based health programming for 17 years, if you didn't know that, actually. Uh, they have two organs, um, their uh, therapist, and they provide um, diabetic care for a number of students at uh, several of the Catholic schools. And it's that's been one of the biggest blessings, is because we have such a high number of children with diabetes. So, so we already have that. Our school nurses do. Okay. So the things that we that we think that this provider would provide over and above what a school nurse can already do is what? Oh, so, so I come in, I have a sore throat. A school nurse cannot give Tylenol, cannot give anything they call. Uh, they can if you send it, but not if, if you send, send it. Person. Correct. Okay. But you, they typically send the student home if they have a sore throat. Uh, an NP or PA that works for a school-based health center can run strep tests, determine if that child is contagious. If they're not, they can go back to school. Same thing with, oh, I have a headache and I have a bellyache. I wish we had a school nurse here. I wish we had the Madison school nurse here to tell us like how often that is. If they get called, the parents have to come and pick them up. The, the school-based health center can determine if it's actually something that needs to be seen. Also, most nurses, the school nurses can't do or don't do referrals out. A school-based health center does many referrals out to specialized care, and also school-based health centers have a um, typically have an obligation to address social determinants of health. So if that child needs help getting transportation, if their um, you know parents struggle to get there, they try and set up the referral system to where they can get to the actual appointment. Right. Um, beyond that, uh, I mean, they also have usually a room that children can wait in. Uh, 
if their parent comes and they can actually be seen by a nurse regularly, whereas the school nurse is usually only there part time at most of our schools. Um, and so they're waiting usually in the principal's office, getting everybody sick and um, kind of taking up the time of the principal, which isn't always effective. Uh, so yeah, more, and then also a school nurse can't do well child visits, doesn't usually do sports physicals that I'm aware of, uh, immunizations, um, things like that. Do you all of those things, immunizations? Absolutely, physicals, even, absolutely, sports, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, W.B. William Hospital said that specifically, and that's what all schools, school-based health is not there just for sick kids, it's there for healthy kids too. Okay. Um, in the MOU, it, it talks about behavioral health, what do you perceive behavioral health needs looking like and what types of um, complaints you think you'd be seeing with that? We talked about that um, in our meeting at Madison and just how looking at the future, yes, it's a definite concern and definite need. Um, we, we have what we can do here in the school system, provide the on-site um, therapy and you know, can contract with people to come in and do the social work aspect. But then what happens if we have trouble, we don't refer, we can't refer out past a certain point um, or there's no follow-up with the parents. So looking at a mental health piece, um, it would be that they're seeking prescribed um, medicine or those types of things which once it comes from the social work aspect. So um, but that was definitely looking at the future. So that's what a student could potentially go in, see the PA, but then be prescribed no, medication, no, no, not no, the PA, no. 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 Those would, be referred out for those would have to be somebody that was hired in addition to the NP, so that's very futuristic. <laughs> Yeah, most, most school-based health centers that are running for a long time, they've got medical, behavioral, dental, vision, care, all on site. And so there's a continuum of care, right? If your PA is concerned uh, about your, um, uh, your mental health, they can refer to a psychologist, to a therapist, who can provide different techniques. And the, the good thing is, is that the building has nothing to do with the school, right? Which is a big burden on a lot of school systems and makes it difficult to provide. Billing. billing, yeah, like for tier three services, mm -hmm. billing. I mean, I don't know about that. Do you, do you guys do billing? Billing hours? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You pay another entity mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, we were talking about prescribing, say, for, for um, strep throat or something. How would that, how would a prescription be handled? Just give it, it would to be, the child to take home? No, no, no. He would give it to the parent. Yeah, like they would have to, I, I, I don't want to speak, that's how, what I'm familiar with at school based health centers is that the parent would have to get They have to show up then and pick up. To get the prescription, yeah. I, that, but I don't want to speak. I don't know if that's true for all school based health centers or if that's what the use plan is, but most of the time. I'm just trying to see, like how does this play out, you know, I mean, we have, like currently how many, um, would you say on a weekly basis, how many trips are, is our staff making to the ER with students who need health care? How often are we driving kids over to the ER? Like, it, like a couple times a day? I think it's more that they're, when I said that children are being seen by the ER, it's usually their parents are calling like at, um, not during school hours. But I mean, I don't know, that could be happening. I'm just, you know, like as we were assessing, we know that these are kids who have a need and that they're different, you know. Our, our staff is currently taking care of them, so I'm just kind of curious to see what, how often um, I had a couple, where did we get the policy we drafted it? That was with Jacob Manuel. Oh, Jacob drafted it last week. Okay. Being our legal counsel. Okay, so that was back in the Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've got, like, a few things that I, you know, things that I would submit just based on, um, and he did mention that, um, doing his quick review of the clinics that were here in the state, that there was no, no county had a policy. So he's like, I had to start from scratch. I took some wording. I, you know, he's like, I couldn't really model it after a successful county, um, you know, because there wasn't all that. So and, he's and I think that might be because they're in counties that school-based health centers are so prevalent. The school board doesn't have to question what a school-based health center is because you can just look at the next town over. We are really unfamiliar with school-based health centers in this county, but they are so common in the rest of our state. Um, West Virginia is a leader in this movement. Um, if you want to view one, you can go up to Weirton or you can go over to the Belmont Career Center. There's also a really thriving uh, school-based health center at the Belmont Career Center for the high school students that go there. Yeah, I mean, some of the things that I'll, I'll send my comments in, but um, you know, it says the school-based health center will encourage parental guardian involvement. You know, like I would want that to say, hey, um, 
shall contact the parent. You know, instead of encouraging the involvement between the student and the parent regarding their health care, I would want the provider contacting the parent. Um, Every time they're seen? I think so, yeah. Letting them know that the status I, is I will, reaching out. I'm going to be totally blunt. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. For, for the, the school-based health center to be sustainable, there needs to be a universal consent with an option to be contacted every single time, like have, sign that form, or an option to never be seen, or a universal blanket consent. Because it for a child to call up a parent, they might be able to get a hold of you, they're not gonna be able to get a hold of every single parent. That the school-based health center is actually designed to help the children who usually you can't get a hold of. I'm, I'm aware of that. So, but like after the provider sees the child, oh, absolutely, you can't call the parent. Oh, at that's standard. Yeah. That, yes, that's absolutely. Yeah, they will. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. standard. You have to do that. Call the parent yeah. and say this. One but I thought you meant before. Yeah. No, right. I know. The parents I, will have I, that I right. That's the thing yeah. on your option. Yeah. If I'm the parent that wants to be contacted, yeah. and you say, "Look, that's that's a relief that my child's being treated without harm." Mm -hmm. That covers the hurdle to me. We've given you the choice, and you the choice as a parent. And then the only other thing that I would want, I think Mr. Cross touched on this as well, but in the consent form that would be signed by the parents, like in the example one, it says, by law, some information requires the student to sign consent prior to disclosing to anyone, including parents or guardians. So we've talked before how there are certain cases in state law where um, parents don't need to provide informed consent, and I would want to make sure that, our, that the parents were made aware of what those situations are before they decide if they want to provide a blanket. It looks like they're already on there. So that's what you're referring to, the first page of the... <coughs> I'm looking at, they don't have any page All numbers, minor children the very first. Um, prior to receiving services must have a parent consent form on file with the following exceptions or then other issues of the life. Limb threatening emergency. I'm talking about on the, where it says consent for a school-based health clinic. It's one of the last pages under the consent form. By law, some information requires a student to sign consent prior to disclosure to anyone. So there are, I know there are certain exceptions in state law to when the health care provider um, needs to talk, talk to the parent about what they would discuss with the student. Um, and we've talked about those before. There's just four separate ones that under West Virginia state law. So I would want to outline that and lay it out in the um, consent so that the parents, before they sign it, they know these are the times when, by state law, they don't have to call me and <laughs> tell me what, what they talked about with my child or what the, they care for. So that's the only other thing that I would want to add to it. So that just, there's just full informed consent by everyone um, of what exactly is. Yeah, by state law is ambiguous. I mean, right. I, I, they'd have to go look it up, and fortunately yeah. we have that. And you just yeah. list it and say, okay, yeah. when you sign this is when you won't receive consent yeah. because under state law you don't have to receive it. Right, because I didn't know about any of that before I started looking. We can add it. We have the language. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Anything sure. else for these? Comments? Anything else for these fine ladies? No, guys, thanks for the discussion. Yeah, I mean, this so is how we get things done. Yeah. You know, it, it is just a little back and forth and trying to find that soft landing area for all of us. I appreciate all of your work. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Satterholt, do we want to do start times today? Um, really, I wanted, wanted to have a conversation about the uh, minutes in the day with the high school, but we just got this big packet of information when we got here and I don't think I got it in the email. So that's my fault. I thought you were interested in the information that Mr. Crumb spent the time okay. down here. That information that's in your folder is probably all things that the Board of Education has already read because it's the calendar policy in 2510, which is the education policy indicating how many minutes. So um, that's where we are with that. Oh, okay, so I guess I'll, I guess we'll have a conversation then. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was how the like the minimum number of minutes that we've talked about at one point in time um, for the high school was um, 345 think, minutes yeah, per day. Yeah, and then we added the 60 minutes to that, which I think was at six hours and 45 minutes, is that right? Um, but then in our, in the agreement, or the, what was being sent to Ed Law, oh, sorry, but, We'll write 30 for the calendar, and then there's a 30 for lunch that's beyond the instructional requirement, right? So there's a, the minimum instructional minutes, and then there's the 30 minutes that we ask for the calendar to be able to have the PL days and snow days. And then aren't there 30 minutes out for lunch that are above the instructional minutes? Yeah, there was wires. 
I think we have about 30 minutes of required lunch. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, so I just was curious, this is what I was, I was trying to talk about last time, but I didn't have this paper with me. Um, but if we're telling edge log it's seven hours and seven hours and five minutes, but, but we know that it could be six hours and 45 minutes. Um, that's an important 20 minutes in the day there that we could play with where the high school maybe goes that 20 minutes shorter, um, which could help it all, you know, help yeah. maybe help the whole thing potentially make sense. We don't need to go through every email. I haven't even looked yeah. at it. No. Dave, 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 I do, I do want to say one thing. We did have a wonderful discussion uh, at one of the uh, committee meetings on starting time. And one of the things we established was that we did not want to cut the instructional time for the high school. That that was something that was, I don't want to say sacred, but so important that our kids maintain the amount of instructional time that they have. Um, particularly those kids that are working um, for awards, they're working uh, in advanced classes, etc. So. I don't know how deep you want to get into that, but I really feel like that's that's an area that I, I kind of feel like we shouldn't be messing with. Well, we've, been, we've been here for a while. I mean, if people want to table this, we can talk about it at the, at the next meeting. I, I'm fine with that. I know that that's kind of where you were going, maybe. Um, well, we have a meeting tomorrow on school times, and you're going to a strengths concert, so I'm going to right. substitute in for you. Uh, why don't we, you know, I move we table this until our next meeting. Uh, look at the material provided in our packets, have the meeting tomorrow, and then look. And, and I think at, at the end of the, what we're trying to figure out, David, is just what, what are the variables? What, where are there areas of slack that we can work with just to have the full picture in front of us? That, I think that's the goal. Thank you. When you say areas of slack, what is your definition of slack? Here's slack. Is there is a minimum instruction time. Mm -hmm then there is the total time we're in there, which is what, seven hours and five minutes. Is there any slack there? And if there isn't, can we extend school days by five days? I, I don't know, I don't know what, I know that we have our kids in school more than the minimum required. And so is there some ability to move that around to create some flexibility? And, and now I'm gonna go back, we just spent an hour talking about kids' health and the delivery of this clinic. I don't know why we, you know, we want to just stop thinking about kids health with later start time because it is a, it, we can't deny the science. So unless we can't do it, we should keep trying to do it. And part of figuring out whether we can do it or not is what are the variables that we can look at. You know, we, and I hope we can do it, but I need to get to the point where I know we can't before I would stop pursuing it. Well, just as we have questions with the clinic, we are going to have questions with the starting time. So it's going to just take time for us to work through everything, make sure that we all are on the same page as far as information, how things are going to work, what are the effects. I think that's the important thing, that we continue to objectively look at things. So we are going to continue to look at the school-based uh, health clinic. We're going to continue to look at starting times. Uh, there's a meeting tomorrow, a committee meeting tomorrow at 6 o'clock. I guess you're going to be here, Mr. Prop. That's yes, correct. Right. Okay. So we'll meet tomorrow. There's members of, uh, yes, it's the educational communities in on this, principals, teachers, um, service personnel, etc. Okay, consent agenda. Uh, anything you'd like to have pulled? Yes. Any bills and the agenda uh, review? Um, what's the agenda? I, I think you're probably right. It would be the Vista. Yes. That's B. Yes. B and C, please. And I'll pull the E also. Just one quick question. Okay. Let's begin with uh, B. Concerns. Mm -hmm. um, so, looking at that document and memo, uh, it indicates this is there's a letter dated February twenty second, twenty twenty four. And then a, a memo to the board that says that uh, council's, it's currently being reviewed by legal counsel. Has it been reviewed? Yes. Okay, where are the comments? The comments were that it was okay. I mean, that, that's what we recorded when JoJo brought it <clears throat> at the last meeting. I don't think you were here, Mr. Prost, that we had heard back from the attorney. Who looked at it? Um, 
It was a new attorney that Jacob had had at Dinsmore. I will tell you here in just a minute. Were there any comments to this memorandum of agreement? Not from them. They were fine with it. Yeah, they're, they're, I, I'm not fine with it. They're just there's some serious ambiguities with it. Uh, I'd ask that it be pulled off, and I'd like to make some comments to try to tighten it up to things that aren't defined um, that I think are material to the agreement. Um, we can go through all those. I can write on the circulator that we wrote to you, Mr. President. That's fine with me. I have the rest of the board feel on that. If David takes a look at it, highlights the areas where he has some concerns, and gets it back to us. That works for me. Looks here. I do have one question on this before we are. You, are you finished, Mr. Cross? Is this one? I am. I'm just curious. So the four thousand dollars—that's basically just like our contribution to the total um, amount that the person will end up being paid. Is that how that works? Yes. When they say it's non-refundable, I'm, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, when they say it's non-refundable, is it an application? Is it a prepayment to apply for a grant, or is it actually just a payment in towards that person's salary? It's just a payment in towards that person's salary. Okay, and so what happens in year two? Is it just a one year? It's just a one year. So it's one year, and Ameriport would pick up the delta of the 4,000 and they would actually be an AmeriCorps employee? I believe so, yes. There's so we're not giving them a W-2, we're not insuring no, them? Correct. Okay. But, yeah. That, that helps me with trying to figure out some of uh, the, the only problem that I see, excuse me, Mr. 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 Croft and Ms. Satterhall, uh, we have an employee, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Dollar, if that employee started working already? He's volunteering, actually, that He's person is at the state tournament right now. Right. He was hired he was hired as a coach, but that would be a different situation than what, All right. the, what this is. That's an extracurricular contract. Okay, okay so no big deal. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. But he's just not getting paid for the things that he's doing. Well he was going to be doing he, he is getting paid as a coach right. for the middle for the middle school team. And it was uh, Thomas White was the attorney who, who reviewed it from Dinsmore. Thank you. I have one quick question on this. I know that it looks like the Grad is going to be doing mainly robotics type stuff. Will he? Will that like lift some of the burden off of what JoJo is doing? Yes. But then she's also his supervisor. But will that still free up time for her? And yes. End, even though she's spending time with him, his one-on-one. -on -one yeah, supervisor? he's he's also very capable in a lot of the tools in the maker spaces okay. where um, where he can relieve that burden from her having to be at every building. So mm -hmm. it's just we originally we had uh, three people. We were doing that, um, and then we went down to one, um, but it's just building that capacity, and he just has the skills and the talent to be able to do that while not necessarily being a, able to be a teacher and mm -hmm. hire. So, um, Would this, so this is a one-year thing. Would we be looking to keep it, keep something like this going to I, keep that load <clears throat> off of I, JoJo? I think if you can find the right person, so mm -hmm. it's not, it, there's a, it's such a, Specialized, like yeah, it's such, such a specialized skill set. Mm -hmm. So, but yes, I mean, I think JoJo definitely would like to help, have some help and to be able to support the teachers. Um, but it's just gonna, I, I don't know that we would have a VISTA person every year. So and we, we found that out in working with the uh, state robotics people mm -hmm. and how they're able to supplement their staffing issues through that. So she, she might have more opportunity now that we're open up to that big network um, to have a pool, but this is a candidate that, that is working with our kids already, so. Any other questions? Okay, let's just go down to E just for fun. Adjusted the salary schedule. Molly, would you like to talk oh, about yeah. that? Okay, he just, I just repeat that again. There, 
we needed to add another position because we no, it's not a okay. position. It's just the second part of the supplement that we afforded um, two other employees oh, okay. for going taking on additional work. And initially, um, it was to be a three, and we accidentally left that person off, so we wanted to correct it. Okay, pay bills. Who would like to begin? I'm glad to start. Good to see you, Mr. Benick. <laughs> well, bait and switch, you said you weren't going to be here. Um, check number 218846. It's, it's the Committee for Children. It's, it's an ESSER. I ask you this every time. How, how are we going on spending that down and are we close to having exhausted those federal funds? No, we're 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 in the last we're using the last um, ESSER grant. We're really not close to being able to spend down the entire amount. We're just we were we were awarded twelve million dollars. We spent a lot of it on HVAC. Twelve million dollars, you know, just checks like this don't go so far. Well, that's why I, I, I think it's a, a tribute that we spend it on what qualified and what isn't we return. That's and and the state has given us a couple other options, such as maybe using that money on substitutes for something like allowable. That's something that I'll be making sure that I take care of this year. Um, you know, my my projection. I, I, I'm projecting that we're gonna we're not gonna be. Terrific, thank you. Is there any ability to spend any of that on buses? That was a question. Mr. Saunders, that's their three, because that's what we're down to. Yeah, yeah. 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 three would have to be some kind of. Yeah, but would be looking at it? Yeah. I mean, so yeah, now. well, the only problem is mm -hmm. that it has to be spent by September. September yeah. is the end of, and like, we're not going to be able to pay that. You see. Any expansions from that, or is that pretty locked in? Yeah, that, the, the, the date to actually spend the money is locked in. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not that we can negotiate, but being that the deadline is September 30th, I'm not sure if we can have like tied or dollars. Okay. At this point. That the, the, the inquisition would want to do that, or that not it that would be covered? Would, not that we would want to do that, but we would be actually able to do it. So, I mean, we don't want it, but the deadline. So when you say able to do it though, if let's just say we don't even know this, or say we were able to use it to buy buses if we wanted more buses, what would make us not able to do that? We can't get the buses on time to actually pay the employees. What's the lead time on that? Um, a year. We um, haven't gotten the bus from the board. Not less than a year is fair. <laughs> yeah, that's very fair. <laughs> that's very fair. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Molly, are you finished with that? Uh, yes. Uh, well, sure. actually, one last thing. Sorry. Enough. Sure. Stephen, you did send us at my request, like the way that the board has been spending all spending all these. At some point, whenever you think it makes sense, I'd love to put that up on the website so the community can see. I don't know if you want to wait till do it like one excerpt at a time, like we're on the third one, or you know show how the first two were spent and then get to the third one. Sure. I think that'd be information that would be useful to people. Okay, okay check 218900 Southern Regional Education Board. It, it's uh, Willing Park High School Mathematics Teacher Coaching Support. I'm not sure what that is. It was $8,000, $8,800. Mm -hmm. Mr. number on that, Dave? Mr. Saunders. Two one eight nine hundred. Thank you. We contracted with SREB to they send a teacher, and then we have our teachers meet with that teacher. They were going through algebra last year, and then this year geometry, and so that's kind of like a, a coach coming in for the teachers, and then we have the teachers do professional development with.
with that person at the SREB sounds. So we're bringing somebody in to coach yeah. our teachers. What's the organization you referenced? I don't know. That. Southern, Southern Regional Southern. Education Board. Can we do that annually? I'm not saying we're doing it every year. We did it <coughs> last year, we did it this year with geometry. We're evaluating where we are, whether we continue to do it or not. Okay. Check 218966 was uh, OC, the Ohio, the Ohio County Development Authority for 10,648. Does that take into account the 5,000 they knocked off of the bill? Yeah. So they reduced the bill by almost 30%. So that uh, uh, was a kind gesture of, of uh, Ohio County Board to help us with the robotics. That's all I had, Steve, thank you. Sure. I have a couple beyond that. The, all the dates plumbing at the high school, do you just like, have a lot of sewer issues up there? What, what kind yeah, of it's, uh, <laughs> students unfortunately like to put stuff down. Uh, and in this particular case, we also found that a Stone was clogging one of the pipes, so we had to dig that up. Um, it was in the pool hall area. There was about 25 to 30 feet of concrete that we had to try to take off, dig out, cut the pipe out, put the pipe in, and put it all back together. So sometimes we have uh, the equipment that we can help push, whether there's a little water bottle, Tampons, toilet paper, uh, the, the new man moisture wasn't being called. It's like supposed to be flushable and stuff, but not quite flushable. Um, it may get stuck in areas. So they have a bigger, stronger jetter, jetter, jetter that's able to push the stuff through. You can't always grab it and pull it out. So uh, unfortunately, that's what we've been dealing on throughout. Park High School. Yeah, I just saw several of them on here that thought maybe something had occurred. Was the stone a student thing? That was not. Okay. So that was actually in the ground. Yeah. So it had okay. taken a pipe this big and not cut it in half. They were all in moist at one time. Okay. They, they, I mean, they, they weren't all of them. Yeah. So yeah. Like, oh, what's in the no, no. And, and, and you'll probably see another set such as okay. this because it does take into account. Okay. Um, and the only other one, I saw several of the community and school invoices on here, and this is kind of just a larger question, I guess. Um, but we've got the grant money that pays for the people. Um, is this something that we've created a budget for going forward in terms of extra, like when we buy supplies, when we, you know, all of the, the additional things that we're adding, um, or that end up being required? Are we looking long term of what we think next year, you know, the budget will require for those? Purchases? Um, yeah, we are. We we'll, we will look at that during okay. the budgeting season. Right now, it's pretty easy because we're, that's actually one of the other items that the Department of Ed is suggesting we use ESSER funds for. Okay. So, and being that this is a three, that is a three-year mm -hmm. grant, so mm -hmm. we have plenty of time to spend that money. Okay. Um, so we're using some ESSER funds on that. Okay. Um, it's a three-year grant, so right now. Good. Yeah. Okie doke. Um, do I have a motion to accept the consent agenda items A, C, D, E, and F? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor of uh, of consent agenda? <laughs> it's been a long night. Consent agenda items A, C, D, E, F. Do so by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. 4 0, Ms. Davis. Okay. Uh, future meetings. Monday, March 25th, public hearing on the calendar at 5 45 here in this office. Monday, March 25th, regular meeting, 6 o'clock, the board office.
the recess meeting on C, uh, Monday, April 8, 2024, regular meeting, 6 o'clock at the board office. And then on Tuesday, April 16, 2024, levy order meeting at 8 a.m. here in the board office. It reconvenes March 25th, 2024 in that recess meeting. And then finally, Monday, April 22nd, 2024, regular meeting. There being no further business before the board,